All right, you good? I'm good. In fact, I'm better than good. <clears throat> if I was any better, there'd have to be two of me. <laughs> I, I think we've already started. <laughs> hey, uh, Disco, welcome to 10% True. Thanks so much for joining me on the channel. My pleasure, Steve. It's, it is an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's it's great to see you. I think um, uh, I told you this privately anyway, because you and I are friends and we've uh, we've chatted offline about it a couple of times, but you're my number one uh, guest or you were the guest that I wanted to have on first when I started this podcast in 2019, I think it was. Uh, so it's great to finally see you. And I think that this is my 100th episode. So it's a fitting... Yeah, well, my procrastination worked in my favor, didn't it? <laughs> it I'm not, now we're from one to 100. <laughs> So, so you're going to talk about yourself in a minute, but before you do that, let me just give a quick intro uh, for, for the audience's benefit. Um, so yeah. I, call you, I call you Disco. Um, my kids call you Uncle Doug. But some people know you as uh, Douglas C. Um, Dildy, the esteemed and, and famous and very well-respected author and historian. And you've written a, a number of... Well, it's, it's the truth. I mean, you go and look on Amazon. Go and look at your 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 ratings on Amazon for the for the books that you've published, and and um, you know that tells you everything you need to know about the quality of your writing. So you've written everything from World War II to Korea and then modern day. Um, and I had the privilege of co-authoring the world's greatest book on the world's greatest air superiority fighter with you, which is a book called F fifteen Eagle Engaged. One thing I was going to ask you, it's a bit cheeky, but you and I also co-authored an F sixteen book together. Now you're an Eagle guy, as anybody looking at your background will be able to tell. Did you ever go and tell your eagle buddies that you'd written a book on the Fighting Falcon? No. No, I never did. <laughs> Not that I'm ashamed of it, uh, but it was, uh, you know, it was uh, eclipsed by by later, because uh, that was our first, so my first with you. Uh, and it was later eclipsed by, uh, by, by uh, you know, Eagle Engaged and, and other efforts. Yeah. So, so you are um, known by different things depending on on who it is that's um, uh, listening or reading. But I thought I'd point out that you are that guy because uh, sometimes people come to me and say, after years of listening to the podcast, they say, oh, "I didn't realize that you'd written a book or that you were an aviation journalist or whatever." So, so that's your background. Now, there are lots of things for us to go, to go through to cover to talk about. Um, just referencing and linking to that World War Two bit. Um, You've written a fantastic book on the Battle of Britain, um, and you know, again, we've talked about that privately. And, and my podcast is mostly concerned with everything post Vietnam. I've had a couple of Vietnam vets on the channel, right. never really had anything that and that's that, good. that predates that. But it would be yeah. good. And again, we've already talked about the fact we're not going to do this in one sitting. We're probably going to do two or maybe even three episodes. So for anybody listening, I'd like to at the end of our conversation get to the Battle of Britain story as you oh, researched it and, and you told it, because I think that. Well, I'm already going off on a tangent, but you have brought your military training as a campaign uh, specialist, somebody who can go out and build a campaign and lead, lead air power into battle. Uh, you've taken that knowledge and you've applied that to an analysis of the Battle of Britain. And that's where you know this unique insight, I think, comes from. So, so let's talk about that at the end. But let's start okay, at great. the beginning for the moment then. You come from a family of, of flyers. You told me about your dad. Tell me about why you wanted to get into flying and uh, why it is that you joined the Air Force? Well, those are um, actually two questions addressed in the same subject. Um, my father always had an airplane when I was growing up. I would go out to the airport, even if we weren't going to go fly, to wash the airplane, change the oil, pamper it. Um, and flying with him was always such, not only a, not only fun, but it was always an adventure. We, we would go places. We, uh, we lived in, uh, in Texas. We fly to Mexico. We fly to Colorado, to the mountains. Uh, we flew to Wyoming to watch a, the, uh, the grandfather of all rodeos up there in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So, so to me, flying airplanes was part of my life growing up. It, it was like riding in the family car. Um, so I thought, I thought every kid did that, you know, <laughs> went flying with their dad. But, uh, so I, I already knew by the time I was age 10 that I wanted to be a pilot and my father uh, encouraged me to uh, uh, seek an appointment at the Air Force Academy as the surest way of becoming a pilot. Uh, and what that meant to him was that he wouldn't have to pay for my college education. I would get to be a pilot and get a college education in the same uh, same effort. Uh, and he would get to save all that money, which has helped him continue to afford his 
airplane. Anyway, uh, so I went to the Air Force Academy, and I was really surprised. I'd already had my, uh, I had already obtained my my uh, pilot's license, A seventeen, flying my dad's uh, Cessna one eighty two uh, Skyline. And uh, so I went off to the Air Force Academy thinking I was going to be surrounded by airplanes. I didn't get to see an airplane for three years because it's actually a military school (laughs) in the guise of some sort of aviation-oriented academy. Uh, So I I, uh, suffered through that until uh, my senior year and finally got to uh, fly Cessna 172s, T-41s through the screening program. And then joined the Aero Club and flew their airplanes uh, during the rest of the year. Uh, and sure enough, was able to qualify for a pilot training slot at Vance Air Force Base. So, you know, the, the short version is, uh, the soundbite is, I always wanted to be, become a pilot and joining the Air Force enabled me to do so. And so uh, arriving at Vance Air Force Base, I had really no problem with the T-37 which is just another Cessna, uh, only you know powered by a couple of a uh, couple of Bunsen burners instead of real jet engines, and uh, then went on to a T thirty eight. Did very well there. That was the top pick to stay at Vance Air Force Base as an instructor, and so um, we'll get into the F fifteen a little later. So anyway, that that's how I won my wings, and uh, I graduated high enough to to basically pick my assignment. And and that's uh, that's the one I picked was to remain there as an instructor. Am I misremembering? Um, you and I have done a few road trips. We spent hundreds of hours talking, and you've told me just entertaining story after entertaining story. But am I misremembering? Did, did you get a letter from the commandant of the academy? Yes, I did, and I can actually go into the other room and uh, and show you. But um, uh, my personality and military discipline did not gel well together. Uh, so the Air Force is looking for conformists uh, rather than um, think, yeah, thinkers, I suppose. And so um, I was a, I was not a, uh, I was not a, a conforming individual. I got, uh, I got three uh, cadet disciplinary boards, uh, which are the cadet equivalent of court martials in my first three years there, one for skipping class, uh, one for going downtown in the dead of night, uh, it's called going over the fence. So I went over the fence of downtown, had a good time, and then uh, got caught when we got back. And the third one was drinking in the dorm. Cheers. Uh, and so the, the commandant, after three CDBs, Cadet Disciplinary Boards, uh, the commandant wrote a letter to me and sent a copy to my parents, which was very embarrassing, saying, after defining all of my um, uh, sins and crimes against the, the academy and its uh, its uh, regulations, uh, the, the commandant, the next paragraph has his own expression of his uh, discontent with me. And he said that um, that I question your... Um, with, I was on attitude probation, aptitude probation, and academic probation all at the same time. Uh, I, I was on what the Animal House calls double secret probation. And uh, in, in his so letter, the paragraph uh, says that, uh, I question your suitability to become an officer in my United States Air Force. But I did. I cleaned up my act. I, I graduated. I was on the dean's list academically by the time I graduated because I, I, I really flourished uh, in my major, which was history. So I did really well in that, and that brought my my grade point average up, and and I was able to uh, to uh, to graduate uh, not not very high at all, but at least not at the bottom of the class. Uh, so I've taken that letter after 26 years of service. They give you a, a nice big certificate. Saying, um, you know, Colonel Douglas C. Dildy, uh, in in grateful appreciation uh, from your nation and your Air Force for 26 years of honorable service and exemplary leadership as an officer. And so, in that big folder, right next to the the I done good 
uh, certificate signed by the chief of staff of the United States Air Force and the president himself is this letter said, you will never amount to shit in my Air Force. So there, Brigadier General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, Jr. Oh, it was Vandenberg. <laughs> that was him. Yep. You know, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, was not, uh, I was not the best cadet. I hated the place. I still did not wear my ring. I noticed. Except for going to reunions. Even though, as an artist, I designed the ring. I designed the, the class crest that's on the side of our ring. But I, I don't wear it because... It was a great place to get an education and launch into the Air Force, but it's not a not a place I want to. Uh, it's not a place I think of fondly hmm. due to the experience. Anyway, well, well, maybe we can we can talk a little bit later about you know what makes a fighter pilot and individualism and you know class oh, uh, yeah. type, type A personalities and nonconformity yeah. and those things. So that's that'll be interesting. Interesting. Discussion. Yeah, individualism, as as you well know, that's a big part of it. And that's what I was exhibiting that to my detriment. In a place I was supposed to conform and not be an individual, I was supposed to be one of one of the squad, one of the squadron, you know. And I was socially. <laughs> <laughs> we had a good time. I had a uh, you 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 could not own a car. This is one thing they did not catch me. At. You could not have a car at the Air Force Academy until you were a senior. Back in those days, back in the back in the uh, the dark ages. Um, but I had one after being there for, for uh, six months, I went home for Thanksgiving, now Thanksgiving holiday, Thanksgiving break, and I just couldn't take staying cooped up in the place. So I drove my 58 Chevy Impala back to the Air Force Academy, parked it just outside the main gate, and then I was, I was the most popular guy in my squadron because none, none of the rest of my classmates had cars. Had, they would have to bum a car off of a, off of a, a senior or find find a girlfriend that would come get them from you know drive up the hill to, to fetch them but but uh, every friday night uh another four or five of my classmates i would you know i would i would get a ride down to the, the main gate of the academy get in my car drive up to the, drive up the hill pick up the other four or five guys that we were going to go drinking together and we'd go have a party We'd rent a motel room. We put uh, put loads of ice in the, in the uh, bathtub, a couple of kegs of beer in the ice. We'd have a full bar on the sink in the bathroom, and invite all the girls we all, to, all both the girls that we knew. <laughs> <laughs> come on down to come on down to the lazy inn uh, for a party with thirty seventh squadron. So. So yeah, they didn't catch me at that, though. But um, the, the, those stories uh, are pretty popular during the reunions about uh, how Doug Dilley had this illegal card, and we we benefited from that. So. <laughs> T- tell me about vaping then. So first assignment instructor pilot, you just mentioned that's what you were, you were going to do. You were the top pick for that. Um, I've always thought vaping is kind of an interesting concept, and the RAF does the same thing. The RAF will, they call them creamies. They skim the the top of the it's right. supposed to be the top of the fat you know the, the good quality best quality candidates um put them in the fake job but for me it's always been a curious thing that you would take somebody with so little experience and then you put them in the cockpit with somebody else who's got no experience of, of something like a t-38 um yeah. how, how does it work then what what is the philosophy behind you faping the philosophy behind is that in kind of a similar way uh, uh, as the air force cavity no experience is required. We only taught the things we were taught. We were we were not permitted to uh, to uh, experiment, if you will, with the flight envelope of the T thirty eight. We just flew the maneuvers the way we were taught. We taught the maneuvers the way we had been taught. So that's all you really had to uh, be able to do. But of course, you had to be able to do it well. Uh, there was the the uh, the powers that be. Uh, they were um, definitely looking for good judgment, good airmanship, we call it. And you generally exhibited that by going to bases that were not their train command bases. You'd go to a civilian airfield, you'd go to a Navy base, you'd go to a real Air Force base and uh, show up on an initial, you know, break uh, into uh, down, put the gear down. But this is all a different environment. It's not the, um, the uh, you know, prairie air patch. 
out in Oklahoma or Texas. So, uh, so if you, as a pilot, as a student pilot, if you showed good judgment in how you performed out of the box, so to speak, uh, then, then, and you know, in other aspects of just daily flight, then the instructors would rate you fairly high. Okay, this guy can this guy can handle you know things that are outside the norm. Uh, but we, of course, like I said, we were not uh, expected, and, and uh, we were quite discouraged from from uh, attempting to do any kind of maneuvers, stuff, stuff that we'd read about or heard about that was not uh, included in the syllabus. So, so if you're just looking for people to uh, teach new pilots the same things that they just learned, then that's fine. That works. But you don't want a lot of that. Uh, I think uh, each squadron, probably 50% of, uh, uh, of the uh, of the complement of pilots, instructor pilots, were fakes. Uh, not, but not more than that. There was there was old heads, so to speak, uh, people from other other uh, commands that had gone out from pilot training, and many of them had gone to uh, airplanes, uh, large airplanes, uh, uh, air crew airplanes. In other words, C one thirties, B fifty twos. If they did not, if the if they did not uh, upgrade to aircraft commander in their three-year tour, and they were still a co-pilot, then the best that they could get would be to return to ATC as an instructor. Really? Again, puts them back in the in the container, back in the box. They only have to, to fly the scripted maneuvers and the t- approaches and types of landings and all that hmm. uh, because they did not show you know, the desired advancement or levels of proficiency uh so you, so you put them in a you know in a more controlled environment shall we say uh than than upgrading to aircraft commander for fly with a with a crew in, in a large airplane which i did in fedex fedex uh after uh my second graduation then um then uh you you have to really have a lot of judgment there because you're dealing with multiple people personalities uh skill sets uh Anyway, so uh, so so vaping as a concept is a good one. Uh, overall, now yeah, uh, it has a downside in that it uh, costs you three or four years before you can move on to a, a real fighter if you're interested in flying fighters. Uh, the good side of that particular uh, coin is that you go to fighters with a lot more experience than the recent uh, undergraduate pilot training. Uh, graduates, uh, because I went to uh, F-15s and I had 1,200 hours of flying time in fast jets, uh, in addition to the 200 or so the, uh, student time. So, you know, I, I knew how to fly an airplane. I knew how to fly T-38 uh, very well, uh, just from the experience of it. So, so it's a good concept. Yeah, I suppose the the numbers also would indicate that it, it works because you you there just aren't that many fapes who are sort of scraping themselves off against the the ground or the runway or whatever. I mean, I I do remember <clears throat> fairly recently there was a mishap report that came out that that was a T thirty eight fape with a Japanese student in the front and. Uh, the Japanese student just flew it into the ground on the approach, and the fape didn't catch it. They both died. Um, and I yeah. just wondered. Um, so, so having established, then you're you're operating within the confines of the norm. Let's say you know a set of things that you can and can't do, and you're not playing around with those things. Um, were, were there times where you were caught out, or there, were there times where somebody in the front scared you, or um, you know you had to remind yourself of your role as a sort of a guardian or custodian or whatever of it. Uh, it it is easy, especially if the student is short promise, to let them go a little too far and get and get you both in in trouble. Uh, well, the T thirty eight T thirty eight is uh, a viceless airplane, except for uh, in the final turn, especially with no flaps, because it has like a F one hundred four wing. Very thin, uh, symmetrical wing, uh, and it, it won't stall per se, not in a traditional way, but but it will sink. It will drop like a rock, uh, like an anvil. It has a glide ratio of an anvil if you get behind the power curve, because those two little J85s will not power it out. You have to lower the nose, dump the nose, and get the airspeed back. Because the 
the, the little jets will not do it. So, so it's easy. In fact, we lost one uh, when I was there in the final turn. No flap. Practice no flap. Touch and go. Uh, and the instructor left us to go too far. He got slow behind a power curve. The seat brake developed, and it's uh, and at the altitudes in the final turn, we're talking five hundred to a thousand feet HG out. It's difficult. There's no ground rush, so you you, you don't know that you're in a a humongous. Uh, sink rate because the nose is still up because it doesn't stall like like a regular airplane it's just going and slicing downhill um and so you don't have a perception especially if you're looking out around the horizon or at the at the landing touchdown zone you don't have a perception of the sink until it's too late so it's, it's, in that case or in that situation the final turn uh it's airspeed runway airspeed runway airspeed runway you're always checking airspeed uh rigorously to be sure the student's not getting you slow so so anyway that the, the only times I, was, I would scare myself was letting my student go too far in that particular regime everything else that was never you know formation flying you always guarded the stick very closely you know the closer you flew to him to the lead the closer you guarded the stick that sort of thing and you learn those those techniques You've referenced then the twelve hundred hours you got by the time you got you got to the eagle, and uh, you know the pros and cons of that. I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about when you first set your sights on on the F fifteen. You know, why did you want to go and fly the F fifteen? Uh, what were the options available to you? I wanted to go fly the F fifteen from my time at the Air Force because the F fifteen was in its desired stages. The Air Force magazine was coming out with, I mean, every other issue would have something about the F-15, the FX uh, design, and, and then once it got, uh, once it received a designation. Uh, and and um, so uh, so I always, for that point, even at the Air Force Academy, wanted to fly the F-15. Um, the uh, uh, fast forward a year from, grad- from the Academy graduation, um, uh, the the uh, tactical air command was not taking any recent UPT graduates. I w- I graduated in the last class from UPT at a graduate pilot training that did not have an F fifteen as one of the as one of the airplanes that were assigned. So uh, the uh, the options for my class were four F fours, an F one hundred six. Uh, which was actually a T-33, and then move up to the 106, and a, uh, I think an OV-10, uh, which was actually an O-2 <laughs> to an OV-10. That, <laughs> one thing about the about the military personnel center, if their lips are moving, they are lying. <laughs> uh, so they'll tell you something, but that's not quite true. Anyway, so, uh, so uh, there were four F-4s, coming down and um uh, and uh i wanted an f-15 there wasn't one uh, like i said my uh my flight commander came to me and said doug you're our number one pick to be a t-38 ip and so so my my um logic if you if you will was well i could go to the f-4 uh and then maybe if i if i do really really well there uh, I can get an F-15 as my follow-on assignment. But that uh, you got to remember, this is uh, 1974, 75, 76. The Air Force is at a massive downsize. Uh, the uh, My instructors uh, were getting, instead of getting flying assignments, they were getting commissary officer, wow. uh, officer's club officer, uh, procurement officer, at you know, what they call the rated supplement. Uh, which is another military personnel center way of putting putting lipstick on a pig and making it look good when it's still a pig, you know. And I I thought, well, if I if I go to F fours and and I don't do really well, stay at the top, then uh, my chances of of, of uh, going to the F fifteen are quite diminished. Uh, so um, so, but on the other hand, I did really well as a T thirty eight student and knew I could do well as a T-38 to, um, instructor pilot. And I did, I was, uh, 
1978, I was the instructor pilot of the year for Vance Air Force Base. So I did really well. And, and that's what assured me of getting to the F-15 was, you know, I, I was a distinguished graduate at uh, Squadron Officer School, instructor pilot of the year for my base. So, you know, I, I, was, at the, I was at the top of my game. And, and getting an F-15, not that I knew that four years prior, but I had I was confident enough in myself that, yeah, I think my chances of getting to the F-15 are greater if I stay here. Hmm. Um, and it proved to be so. And you know Annie. Um, I met her. I met uh, my late wife, uh, Annie, while at Enid as a student pilot. And, uh, I, uh, you know, when, when my flight commander told me what uh, my chances were uh, uh, to be one in four of fours or to be the top guy to fly T-38s. I went back and, and asked her, and uh, she said, well, if you get an F-4, where are you going to go? And I said, McDill, Florida. And she said, well, I'm not going to go to McDill unless we're married. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, if I stay, if I stay here at Bats and fly T-38s and get to develop this relationship with this this lovely lovely girl, then I it's a twofer. I get I get two for one out of one decision. I get two benefits. <laughs> so uh, that's what I did, and things worked out famously in both regards. Oh, that's awesome. So uh, so yeah, that that and plus you know being a Christian, I uh, I uh, give God all of the uh, all of the credit and and, and, uh, and glory and honor for what successes I've. I have had because uh, a lot of what I'm talking about is how I felt led uh, to make these decisions. And, and Annie was, she was a Christian as well. And, uh, and, uh, and so we, you know, we basically followed the Lord to, to that, uh, that career path. And uh, I got to do what I wanted to do. I got to marry the girl I wanted to marry. Um, and uh, we were off from, from that point, I was whew, off to the races uh, in the F-15. Well, that's um, probably more than what you really wanted out of that question. No, but. no, not at all. And, and I should say, here's, here's to Annie. Ah, so, cheers indeed. Cheers. Here's to her. So, so tell me then, just go about some of your other influences at that time. Um, you've just referenced the drawdown, uh, well, the, the downsizing in the Air Force. There's been the drawdown um, in Vietnam. That whole thing has, has come to a, a, an end at, the, at this point in time, or around about this point in time. <clears throat> And one of the things I was curious to know was whether or not you had, um, while you were a FAPE, uh, you know, some fighter guys who were guiding you, who were trying to imbue you with some of the fighter culture at the time. I mean, I know that there's, you know, I don't know if it's still, you know, the herbivores and the carnivores and, you know, but I talked to guys who are FAPEs. Um, and I talked to guys particularly who were LIFT or IFF or whatever it's called nowadays, you know, talking about, you know, the differences in mentality and personalities between those communities, which is not to say one is better than the other, but that, that they are different. Right, but they are different. So, You're so right. did, did you have that? I mean, were there, were there sort of crusty old fighter guys who were, um, you know, at, at the base who were trying to sort of um, guide you so that you would be the right material for, for being a fighter pilot? Were they trying to shape you? No, not you? really. No. Uh, the squadron commanders were typically fighter guys. Um, that I served under, uh, but most of the senior, most of the senior um, uh, officers, meaning majors and lieutenant colonels, uh, they were um, they were from SAC or the Military Airlift Command MAC. Uh, uh, so no, there was not a lot of guidance. Uh, I was I was very blessed that. Uh, my flight commander in T-38 is the one that said that if I wanted to stay in my T-38 that I was their number one pick. He had flown SPADs, A-1s, in Vietnam. And uh, and uh, I respected him a lot. Um, but that's not, that's not a fast food fighter, you know. Mm -hmm. So his mentality was maybe a little different. He was an attack pilot. A-37s, A-1s, uh, A-7s, uh, which is, you know, it's not quite the same as a, a fighter guy, um, but uh, but no, there weren't there weren't any. Uh, I don't remember any flight commanders. Uh, th and those would be the guys who would guide the young guys. Uh, they were they were all looking for conformity and uh, and uh, uniformity, consistency, and 
teaching the maneuvers and um, the various types of approaches and landings. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, career uh, planning being done. That, do that doesn't mean that at the bar on Friday night at the officer's club, there wasn't a lot of talking about what they had come from, what it was like, and all of that. But there was no, I couldn't say that there was any active or proactive uh, uh, guidance to channel uh, members of the squadron, FAPES in the squadron, to certain uh, assignments. Uh, so this is this is me testing my memory. I think November 74, was it November 74 when the F-15 entered operational service with the Air Force? It was around then. Yeah, so was. I'm, I'm probably not a million miles out. Um, yeah, that, that's a Luke, I think. That was a Luke, yeah. So, so, so you were you were going to be then um, not one of the first guys, but one of the earlier guys to get to that uh, that yeah. uh, com that community. Um, before we talk about that and what what it was you found when you got there, could you t tell us a little bit then, as this history major, as this person who was looking at the Air Force magazines and the FX, the av advertisements for the FX, and then later when it became designated the F fifteen, the Eagle what you were seeing, why were you attracted to the aeroplane? What was the Air Force hoping to do with the F-15 and why was there a need for it? I mean, you know, generally speaking, what was behind it? Okay. Yeah, and that's a that's a very, uh, very good question. Um, the Air Force had gone through uh, years of uh, what I would call trauma uh, and loss of identity following, uh, following the Korean War uh, by the uh, by the early '60s, the entire Air Force was was run by uh, by uh, Curtis LeMay and all of his SAC cronies. Uh, in fact, he even uh, as chief of staff, uh, he had been the commander of Strategic Air Command, and their job, you know, peace is our profession, but we're just gonna we're gonna blow the shit out of you. But peace is our profession, right? So um, they're they're the ones that are were tasked to haul nukes over the pole and drop them on, on the Soviet Union. Um, and once, so SAC ruled the Air Force. And once LeMay ruled the Air Force, he put all of his cronies into the major air command uh, commander uh, positions. So TAC was run by a, uh, a I can't remember the, the general's name, but, and, but there were several. Uh, so there were a series of three or four uh, basically B-52 pilots uh, uh, that were running tactical air command. And this is during the Mac early in the McNamara uh, days. And so the, um, the Air Force sold its soul, in my opinion, on the altar of thermonuclear weapons uh, in an effort to, uh, to promote itself uh, as the war-winning service that, you know, we won't have to put boots on the ground anywhere because we can, we can nuke them with SAC. Um, so as far as fighter design philosophy, the only airplanes that the Air Force was buying, fighters, they either had to carry a nuclear weapon or shoot down a nuclear weapon carrying bomber. So 102, 106 so, uh, were the primary you know, uh, bomber interceptors. Uh, the 105 was the primary tactical nuclear uh, uh, weapon delivery platform, followed by the F-111. Um, both of those uh, are bombers and not fighters, uh, as we've seen from their, their performance in air-to-air -air combat and even close air support role. Uh, so uh, so when we found ourselves at war in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, we, uh, we found ourselves facing a MiG threat that we were totally unprepared for. The first engagements uh, with, between Air Force uh, fighters and, and MiGs was from F-100s, uh, the lead sled. Uh, it had no maneuverability at all, uh, uh, facing MiG-17s who were trying to intercept F-105s, trying to drop the Beamer Bridge. So... Uh, so when we woke up and realized, hey, we need something that can shoot down another airplane, another fighter, then the only thing available was the Navy's F-4. So we started buying the Navy's F-4. And we deviated from the traditional Air Force uh, uh, philosophy, I suppose, uh, 
of having single seat fighter pilots like those flying the F-86 and in uh, Korea and, and ruling MIG Alley. Uh, we had, we'd given up uh, on that because now we had an airplane that required two people, uh, one to fly the airplane and one to work the radar. Uh, so uh, so the, the performance of the F-4, partly due to training, partly due to attitude, partly due to the, to the airplane itself, uh, the, uh, and I won't go into all the historical details of what its limitations were but it was not it was not the solution uh so the air force once we uh realized during linebacker that we needed an air a, a dedicated air superiority airplane we need because the f4s were carrying bombs they were flying alongside of 105s to the same targets and if a mid showed up they would jettison their bombs flip the radar to air to air and, and attempt to engage, uh, sometimes successfully, but rarely so. And so the mix accomplished their their job by having you know one quarter of the strike force jettison their bombs just to engage them, right? So so now you only have to worry about seven, the, rest, the remaining sixty to seventy five percent. Anyway, it, it just it was uh, it was a sack solution to a tactical problem. Uh, so uh, so that the the fighter guys at the Pentagon. Uh, and at, at TAC headquarters, knew that we needed a dedicated air superiority airplane, one that could sweep in ahead of the strike package, uh, shoot down anybody who challenged them, and the package could get in and out with minimum losses. And that's how the F 15 came to be. Hmm. And um, I'm not sure why I was so drawn to it. Uh, maybe it was the fact that being a little bit more of an individualist than than uh, I probably should have been at the academy anyway. Uh, I, I just wanted to fly solo. I just wanted to fly by myself. I did not want to fly with another person. Uh, uh, so anyway, that must have had a lot to do with it because that's, that's what I enjoy most is flying solo. I uh, always have and, uh, and still do. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's what drew me to the F-15 was that uh, this is a... This is an individual's airplane. It's, it's you, your abilities, uh, how it, well you work the radar how, and employ the airplane and uh, and the airmanship, the judgment to, uh, to to make the right decision in a split second on what, what you're going to make happen. You have the initiative. So, so tell us, Disco, about the other part of that equation then in terms of the um, lightweight fighter competition that followed um, the the mafia, what was it called, the lightweight fighter mafia that was trying to push for the F-16 versus the F-15, the high cost of the F-15 paired with the low cost of the, let's say, more ubiquitous F-16. How was that going to work? What was your, what, how did you view that? Or And later, how did you come to view that as, a, as an experienced we, eagle guy? We, we were never really sure how it was going to work. <laughs> The, uh, the, the, uh, I was at the Pentagon. I, I had my, uh, my first tour. I was, I was at the Pentagon for a year. Uh, what was known back then as an Astra uh, air staff training program, kind of an internship. Um, and, uh, and the fighter mafia was in the basement of the Pentagon. I had to come up with a follow on to the F4. So, so what drove the F-16 uh, was not a com- competition with the F-15. It was something to replace the F-4. We're, we are now, at this point, we're talking the early 80s. I, I was at the Pentagon in 79, 80. Um, and the Carter administration uh, basically told the Air Force that, because w- what we really wanted was more 111s as our bomb dropper. Because by the time the F-15 had gone through the 70s and was deployed worldwide, by 79, you know, we had bases from Okinawa all the way around to, uh, to Bitburg and, uh, uh, and uh, Schusterberg uh, on, on that side of the planet. So, so the F-15 by 79 was deployed worldwide. Now, it, but uh, there still was a, probably a, a third of the fighter force or uh, or a quarter of the fighter force was F-15s. So there was 
two thirds to the three quarters of the force of still these F4 Phantoms left over from Vietnam, e even C's and D models. Uh, and they were long in the tooth. They were ragged. Uh, their technology was, was lagging badly that what we were seeing being developed on the other side of the iron curtain with the flogger and follow-ons. Um, so, uh, and, and it's, uh, it had a, uh, notoriously bad bombing accuracy record. For instance, the, to harken back to the F-100, it was that the F-100, although it was, uh, the super saver, like the F-86, in terms of its overall configuration, you know, bubble canopy, uh, it had four 20 millimeters instead of the, uh, the, the 650 cows, uh, that it had leading edge slats because it was just a sled as far as generating any turn. Um, so it went to Vietnam as the, as the air to air escort for f one fives. Well, it didn't do so well there. So then they relegated it to, uh, to close air support. And it did really well there because it was accurate with this little, almost primitive gun sight. Uh, it was accurate. Uh, I can remember one of my instructors who had flown at F 100s in Vietnam, he checked in with a fac, uh, cause there were, you know, trucks on the Ho Chi Minh trail that, that needed to be put out of action. And this, and the, uh, the, Checked in with you know it was a buzzard flight of two F one F one hundreds ready to do whatever you want, and the fact goes two F one hundreds. I thought I was getting four F fours, and and both the, the, uh, the buzzard zero one said, "Well, what do you want? Four bombs on the target, or two dozen around it?" Because the F four couldn't hit his ass with both hands in a well lighted room. When it came to precision bombing, right? So, so uh, the Carter administration in 1979, 80, 81, told the Air Force that we are not funding a new bomb dropper for the uh, for the uh, Air Force, and the F-111 had become a fiasco uh, for a lot of reasons. But if you come up with a cheap airplane that will carry bombs, then we'll buy that. So the lightweight fighter it was more of a political decision than it was a, a military decision. So, so, where, did, so where does the Day VFR piece come from? Then I thought I thought the idea behind the sixteen was that they wanted a Day VFR fighter. Um, is that what you're? Is that is that the same thing? Is a Day VFR fighter something that can go out and battle with what they thought was coming down the pipeline turned out to be the MiG twenty nine and drop bombs? Are they different missions? Are they different things? No, Day VFR fighter. The word fighter in Air Force uh, lexicon means air to air and air to ground. It was going to be the air to ground part of the high low mix. I mean, lots of them. They're cheap. If we lose them, then pff, didn't cost much anyway. Uh, but it had no no real uh, air to air capability on uh, the scale of the F 50. The radar could see about 50% of the initial one, 50% of the range of the EU because. It had this little bitty radar uh, antenna. You know, the F-15's got this ginormous. You know, nothing escapes the eye of the eagle. The uh, the F-16 it, it was very nimble, uh, provided it couldn't provided it had you know stripped off all its uh, stores, but it could carry four AM nines, no BVR capability. You know, uh, but it would. At, the, at that stage of development, which is very early, it uh, it uh, was strictly seen as a bomb carrier. Hmm. There were going to be hordes of these things coming in under the protection of the F-15 and dropping bombs because the two things that it did have from the F-15, one is the fly-by horses. As you know, the um, from on top of the stick, uh, or just below the hand grip on the stick, at the top of the stick is a pressure sensor where the, the system senses the pressure that the pilot is putting on the hand grip. And that became the, you know, the right-handed uh, fly-by-wire stick. In, you know, very little movement. In fact, first, there was not at all. And it was just a pressure transducer. The other thing was that the, uh, the computer, the, 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 uh, not the, the fire control computer, uh, had all of the trajectories of all of the bombs 
in the, the B words, in the U.S. Air Force Inventory. And as you know from our research, there was a move afoot at first to, to make the F-15 a bomb dropper. But the Air Force was so hard over about no, no, no. This is going to be a dedicated uh, air superiority fighter because because the Air Force knew that this as soon as you start putting bombs on the F-15, it will be the replacement for the F-4. And because it's so expensive, we're not going to get very many of them. But if we buy these F-16s, it costs about about two thirds of an F-15, maybe even only half. We we basically get to buy one get one free um, uh, for the same amount of money. So uh, that the greatest thing about the F-16 was its uh, growth potential. It was able to outgrow uh, all of, especially with increases in, in uh, computing power, the radar, uh, the engines. Um, you know, the, the uh, remember when the ATM was also being developed at about this time period, the, somebody thought it'd be really nice to, uh, to sling a 30 millimeter gun pod on the belly of an F-16 so that it could shoot tanks too, right? Cause we were expecting them to fill the gap scenario. The Russians are going to come, come across the iron curtain through full of gap and, and try to conquer West Germany. So we needed more, we needed more tank killers, right? So they, uh, they act up the F-16, put a 30 millimeter gun pod on it, lowered it back to the ground and the wheels didn't even touch the ground because it was resting on the belly of the gun pot. Yeah. But so that their solution will put bigger tires on it. Right. <laughs> so, so early on, it was just a simple little sports car of an airplane, but it has such great, uh, uh growth potential. It became a fantastic fighter. Fantastic. So, but it didn't start off like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I could tell you stories, but I won't. No, no, no. Tell the story. Tell the story. Well, uh, somebody, uh, some, somebody. When I was in the Pentagon, the guys that were against the fighter mafia said, "No, no, no. We need a real airplane to replace the F the four, and it's not going to be the F fifteen. Uh, the analogy, because the fuel tankage in the F sixteen, the initial you know, prototypes, was so small." that you plug it into afterburner and you're not going to get out of the county. Okay. So, uh, unless you throttle back, uh, and the, uh, the analogy was that the initial F 16, it had the payload of an F 100 going the speed of an a seven and the, the range of an F 104. In other words, all of the shortcomings of all those other airplanes combined was the F 16. <laughs> they could carry two 500 pounders, mm-hmm. At 420 knots uh, to the to the end of the county, yeah. So anyway, so yeah, it was not uh, it was not favored by the Air Force at all, and the Carter administration basically gave us a an, an ultimatum: you buy this, or you're going to have to wait to a different administration. Hmm. And yeah, you know, how much longer your F four is going to last you? You, you've no. kind of already referenced the the not a pound for at a ground um, slogan, yeah. which I think came from the SPO, didn't it? it? Came from the program office for the for the Eagle. Um, what, but but the F fifteen A did have an air, a basic rudimentary at a ground capability. Um, what was behind that then? That was a backup. In ca- so if we're thinking about this theoretical war, in case all the F sixteens get shot down, you've got to then have your air superiority fighters dropping bombs. That, is that the rationale? Uh, very close to that. That was a, a uh, input from McDonnell Ducks, actually from Mac Air. Um, and they were able, they put, the way they sold it was because what they wanted was us to buy the F 15 as the F 4s replacement as, an, as a fighter bomber. That's what they wanted. They wanted to sell more airplanes. Yeah. So they wanted to build in more capability than the Air Force wanted, but they were willing to do it for free. We will, we will, we will put into the uh, weapons computer all of the uh, all of the Air Force inventory weapons, their trajectories, and everything, and we'll make it that way for free. So, okay, sure, if it's free, we'll take it. You know, and if if uh, push comes to shove and we need to to have this airplane drop bombs, then we have the capability built in. Okay, yeah, there's all the, there's advantages for. For both the service and the, the contract. Uh, and that part of the computer was what went into the F-16. 
Okay. Yeah. So so that's how the F-16 got to be such a good bomb drop. You know, it had the death dot. You know, yeah. the, the pipper that was, that was, as long as you had a radar uh, contact with the, with the ground, that it could calculate where the impact point of the bomb would be. And so it was an extremely accurate bomb dropper mm. in day VFR conditions, hence the term day VFR. Mm. It had no night bomb capability other than loft, you know. Um, so anyway, my point is that is that, that 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 particular decision came out of uh, the, the contractor's attempt to sell the Air Force more airplane that it wanted in the hopes of getting the Air Force to buy more than we were going to. So it's like a, a drug uh, dealer giving someone their first hit for free. There and you then... go. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, so tell us then about the Eagle as it was when you arrived then. So you said, I think, 1978. So we're probably talking, uh, was that right? I uh, went to uh, fighter lead in, in uh, 1980, right after my tour at the Pentagon. And from there to Luke, and from Luke to uh, to Bitburg. Uh, the guys at Bitburg, uh, the airplane had been there for three years. So the um, what we call the initial cadre, um, the guys that had come from F-4s, and, and there might have been some guys from other MDSs, uh, maybe F-100s. Uh, I don't really recall very many. Um, there was one guy from OB-10 as a fact. But anyway, the, the whole squadron was made up of uh, basically uh, former F-4 drivers. Mm -hmm. And they were they were the top guys in, in F-4s. Um, that's how that you had to be to get an F-15 assignment. Uh, the squadron, the 53rd uh, TFS, Tactical Fire Squadron, had been an F-4 squadron. Uh, and it had been an, an air to mud squadron, air to ground squadron. Uh, air to air was its tertiary dock, I think. Uh, it... it Combat role, his third combat role. Um, the uh, 525 at Bitburg Bulldogs, they were the uh, principal air to air squadron in the F 4. Uh, so uh, so the, uh, the makeup of the squadron was all former fighter pilots. Uh, there, were, there was just two or three fakes ahead of me that had come in. Uh, there were uh, a few, uh, maybe, um, maybe. Maybe six to ten uh, guys came to the F-15 right out of pilot training. Uh, the young, you know, the young guys and lieutenants. The fakes were all captains, uh, and then of course we were in the mix with. Uh, oh yeah, one guy was a T-33 guy from uh, Alaska. Uh, so, so, it, so it was uh, mainly F-4s. Um, the um, the climate in the in the uh, on the what I would call the front lines, uh, uh, the ramparts of freedom, we we termed it being uh, being in Western Europe, uh, was at first kind of um, anti fate. Uh, the, there was a fighter pilot prejudice against fates, uh, which basically, if you just you know did what you were supposed to do and and flew well, then then you could overcome that prejudice. And, and, and I did. Uh, I got to be a flight commander because then my first year of being there. Uh, and uh, in that sense, you know, things went well. I, I, I adapted well to fly the F-15. Having 1,200 hours as a as an instructor pilot, you know, uh, keeping <laughs> keeping uh, the second lieutenants from killing me, and then uh, I was able to do well in the F-15 as well. So, so, so just, I'm not just, sure if I even asked that question. That was that was a long ramp. No, 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 no. It was it was, yeah. a, it was an answer to a question I was going to ask, but um, you've just beaten me to it. So just okay. no, no surprise. Always, would, a, always ahead of the. I would like curve. to add though, uh, one of, one of my one of my most uh, distinct impressions uh, and strongest memories is, you know, I, I get to Bitburg, we settle in, and I start doing uh, doing that. Uh, Training and one of the first rides, I think it's the second ride. There's a handling ride. Um, the uh, but the second ride is uh, you go to various NATO air bases. Um, we went to Bouchelle, which is a German F four F base. Uh, uh, Ramstein, another American base. Went to uh, uh, Bolichon, a a, a a Belgian base, 
And so it's to get you acquainted with listening to different accents on the radio. Uh, and also just to the, to the nature of these, these bases. And we landed at Bouchelle. I can remember that. Uh, and on landing rollout, and this is in a tub, two seat mall. Uh, and I, I'm looking around and there's triple A guns in a, uh, in a, in a pattern around the end of the runway and all the gun barrels are pointed east. I had sandbags, bunkers everywhere. And I'm going, holy shit, these people are ready to go to war. You know, I've been, I've been flying my ass off at the, at a little air patch in Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, just happy as a lark, uh, flying, you know, peacetime airplanes in a peacetime environment. And, uh, uh, nobody would even throw rocks at you, much less shoot at you. Uh, and, and I get to this place and man, these guys are wearing helmets and flat vests, uh, out at the end of the runway, man, and these triple A guns and the, you know, the, the Hawker missiles with their radar spinning around and go, you know, okay, this, this is serious. We're serious about this. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, that very strong impression, initial impression. T- tell us um, bef- before we explore that because I want I wanted to talk about the threat. I wanted to talk about your uh, doc statement for the squadron, what it was you were supposed to do, who you were going to go up against, and what the scenarios were. Wanted, um, so, so we'll get to that. But just back up a little bit and tell us about Luke. Um, one of the things that you know, when I think maybe researching the book with you that I learned and, and sort of over time that I have uh, discovered, uh, discovered may be the wrong word, but but I've but I've come to understand is that the Eagle wasn't always, it didn't come out of the chocks as a completed, you know, ready fighter. So the True. APG-63 radar needed development. It didn't come with the ALQ-135, the jamming system that was integral right. to the airplane. That wasn't ready from the get-go. And, uh, you know, we, we're not going to go down the rabbit warren that is the F-35 um, but but one of the things that you kind of look at with the F thirty five and people criticizing it for for not being the complete solution is that well that wasn't that wasn't the case with the F fifteen either so yeah. I wondered could could you tell it us a bit is. about that yeah so what was your experience what was so the airplane had been in service let's say six or seven years by the time you got to it um, what was it what was it like what was complete what wasn't what were the bugs that they were still working out uh, what was your impression of it um, then because of course you retired as vice commander of the thirty third fighter wing at Eglin you flew the, the Eagle for a long time over a long yeah. a, 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 a wide number of years so you got to see right. the completed article well even even then you didn't because now it's a totally different airplane than it was when you retired but yeah, yeah. compare and contrast. Yeah, the uh, you mean the compared to the to the start and finish? Yeah. What you're saying? When you got yeah. to Luke, what were you playing with that you didn't? You know, what what was? Yeah, what did you end up playing with versus what you what you uh, what you arrived at? Well, the uh, well, first let me say that um, that the things that we had initially, uh, we had a, a, a full up uh, bra suite and uh, an onboard tactical jamming suite. That's something that. I never saw a peacetime at Luke. I mean, why waste the the, uh, the baggage on that? Uh, the The radar was. I would not. Uh, it it was it was in its uh, maturing stage, uh, but still, it could look down, shoot down. I mean, the uh, the uh, if if you were if you were on top of the weather, you could find your way to Bitburg by by rolling the the radar to look down. And because it would, it would, it would uh, uh, have radar returns on anything going more than more than sixty miles an hour, sixty knots, uh, and you could you could you could find your way back to Bitburg following the Autobot by really? by mapping with the radar the the high speed Mercedes on on the Autobot. Uh, so the radar was was very good. Uh, it had its uh, its problems in terms of uh, blind zones. But still, um, between blind zones, there was plenty of opportunity to find a target uh, if they were there. Uh, we had uh, uh, A9Ls, Lemas, uh, the Rip Your Lips Off missile, uh, or also known as a the I Wish You Were Dead missile. Uh, and uh, so we could we could take out. Uh, usually, our shooting discipline was uh, two aim sevens, uh, followed by going. That'd be beyond visual range. Uh, two eighty sevens, um, and then when you got into visual range, uh, if if the aim sevens took out the flight lead that you targeted, then you had the Lima that could take out the wing. So you got two kills 
at the merge or before the merge. Uh, so you could you could uh, uh, attrit the enemy formation. The primarily we were we were concerned about floggers. Uh, you could attrit them down to your own formation size pretty pretty easily. Um, so it so it was while there were some systems that weren't as refined as they later became, uh, they were they still could do the could do the job. Uh, at the other end. Now, well, let me let me add. Now, while at Bitburg, we swapped out our A models for Cs um, right when I got there. Uh, so I took several trips back and forth across the Atlantic to pick up uh, brand new airplanes. Uh, my airplane uh, uh, that I got my name, that was able to get my name put on, was uh, seventy nine zero eight zero ninety eighty. In fact. Uh, this uh, this portrait right here is my airplane at Eglin. Yeah, cool. It's the same airplane that I that I flew from uh, St. Louis, Missouri, across the pond to uh, Bitburg, and then eventually got my name put on. Um, and so it was an early one of the earliest C models. Uh, by the time I got to fly at um, at Eglin, uh, it had gone through the multi stage improvement program, and that had a huge and vast increases in capability in every regard. Uh, the initial F-15C was a 7.33G airplane, uh, and it performed well. With all that power, it performed well at uh, seven, 7 Gs or so. Uh, but with the what was called the OWS system and uh, an overload warning system, you could pull 9 Gs uh, in certain flight envelopes, certain parts of the flight envelopes. So even in B, even in BFM, even in uh, visual fighting, it it was better than it was before. The radar was superb, uh, and as you know, there are several iterations of radars uh, towards the uh, towards the end of the of the century, uh, the late 1990s, um, and um, it, and by then we had uh, uh, AIM seven M's, uh, uh, which were very uh, very much improved over the M7F, which we used uh, in uh, in Iraq against the Iraqis, which had some problems. Uh, they were not very reliable. So, in fact, one of the guys in my squadron at Schusterberg, uh, he got a uh, big kill on a on a flogger that was trying to flee to Iraq. He had to shoot all four M7s to bring it down because the first three didn't fire they were ejected uh as you know there were the way this the way this uh this rube goldberg uh ignition system on the m7 it had a lanyard uh so the the, the foot would kick the missile away from the airplane and, and, and pull the lanyard out of the missile and that would allow this the electrical circuitry to become complete and the rocket motor to fire well three of those things just became you know, more rocks in the uh, in the mountains of uh, of eastern uh, Iraq, and finally the fourth one fired and uh, brought down this MiG. So the M7F was not a reliable missile uh, when you only have twenty five percent success rate of it even starting the rocket motor. You know, it's just not reliable. The H7M vastly improved, vastly improved in its ability to track the target almost on its own. Uh, we had aim nine M's. Which uh, had a flare rejection capability. So even if the the bandit that you were uh, shooting missiles at was pumping out flares, trying to drag your missile off, that the AIM nine M would ignore him and and go straight to the heart of the airplane. It had uh, logic in it that that uh, would allow as the little eyeball was looking at the heat source as it was getting closer, then it would it would point the nose of the missile. Uh, further and further in lead of the target, in lead of the heat source. So the, the missile it was to, uh, uh, tailored, designed to, ba to basically stab the target airplane in the back of the airplane, went right to the back of the airplane, rather than go through the, the heat plume and blow up on the other side. Mm. So, so all of, and these are re these are refinement points. I mean, the basic weapon was there. Um, 
but fine tuning it to make it uh, even more lethal uh, was the, the major thing. Uh, the MISIP program uh, provided us with a huge uh, central computer uh, that uh, that uh, provided uh, uh, information, greater information on what you were looking at as a target. Uh, down to sometimes being able to tell you what type of airplane you're looking at. And once you know what type of airplane you're facing, and if you've done your homework at, uh, in Intel, then you know that, okay, that guy can only shoot this far. I can shoot this far. So I can shoot him before he can shoot me. Or if, he, if it is a, a big player, like the flanker, uh, then, okay, I need to be able to get around his radar and then turn in to shoot. Uh, so tactics developed as the as the weapon system was refined to yeah use those capabilities to the very best yeah so so it was a it was an entirely different airplane inside the cockpit it was an entirely different airplane in terms of its own uh, brain and nervous system uh, the radar the computer the the wiring system. Um, the only thing with, that was original in the airplane from the airplane that I flew across the pond was its skin. Right. Just the, yeah, just the just the outside, just the shell. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and that was what almost twenty years or so between uh, when uh, when I flew the airplane across and, and when I retired hmm. from heaven. Same airplane, same tail number. Hmm. You know. And I think, um, you know, in time, maybe the full story of MISSIT will be declassified. You're, you're obviously saying what you can say, there are some things you can't say, and, and it would be interesting to see in the next sort of, I don't know, 20 years or so, whether or not the, the rest of that comes out. That would be that would be pretty interesting. But um, yeah. So, so tell us then, uh, you, you said the threat. So you're at Bitburg, which is Western Germany in the US administered part of West Germany. Um you said that the threat that you were mostly considering or or, or training to was the MiG-23. Um, loads of questions around that then. What did you know about the MiG-23? You, you and I had talked, you, you, you did constant peg. Um, in fact, you knew Mark Postai, yeah. and he was the best man at your wedding with Annie, and, and maybe you can talk yeah. a bit about him as well. It's, you don't have to do it right now, but maybe, you know, um, what did you know about the MiG-23, and what did you think of it? But by the sounds of it, there was a huge technical overmatch. It wouldn't have been something you would have, you were concerned with. But um, how are you training to defeat it? The um, let me say a couple of things first. Uh, uh, we had a great advantage. We being USAFE, the U.S. Air Forces in Europe, had a great advantage in uh, watching the Soviets and the East Germans who flew Big Twenty Threes, watching them in training. Uh, because uh, the um, the at, on the top of in in West Berlin on the top of Tempelhof uh, the old Tempelhof airfield uh, terminal and control tower at the t- top decks of that huge building right now built during the Third Reich uh, there's the, um, the multinational uh, air traffic control center uh, manned by America's Brits, uh, 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 French, and Germans, the four uh, victorious nations. Well, above that is the U.S. Air Force Intelligence radar outfit. And they were, they were watching uh, the Soviets take off from bases all around Berlin. It was, it was the best location for a spy uh, uh, establishment. Uh, and they would... Uh, they would monitor the radio frequencies. They would uh, track the uh, the maneuvers uh, uh, the, the, with, you know, with these with the uh, uh, floggers, the MiG twenty threes coming out as a four ship, splitting into two. Uh, you know, one would make a run towards the, the target and then drag, and the other two would come around the target uh, to the stern. Um, and they were very very scripted, so we knew that. So we knew. That they were there in general terms, they were planning on using four ships, maybe multiples of four, uh, you know, two or three, four ships. Uh, but the the intelligence service, um, uh, the Air Force Intelligence Service, they had this tendency to because they had no understanding of what we were capable of. 
So, so they're watching the, the Soviets practice and call out their shots you know, on the radios and stuff. Uh, and, 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 you know, they're scribbling down the range between the target and the, and the shooter and, and, all that, and all that stuff. But they have no idea how that compared with the F-15. So, so they were constantly trying to tell us, and the terms that we used was that uh, they made the, the rushes to the Florida drivers to be 10 feet tall and bulletproof. And you need to be, you know, you need to be shaking in your boots uh, if you see more than one of these guys show up. Well, yeah, not so much. Uh, so, but because we had been misled by Intel uh, that this threat was far in excess of its actual capabilities, the Florida could carry, it could carry two, um, two Apexes, two AA7s, which is, it said AIMS 7E with the fins rearranged. Uh, and, and it's just, just as stupid as an F4's AIM 7E. It was not even as good as the F15's AIM 7F, much less the mic. The Nick. My, so my point is that, that uh, it had two of those. We carried four. It, it could carry two or four uh, atolls. Atolls. You got. You got to. You got to be. You got to go around behind the the uh, the target and stick your nose up its ass before sh- shooting if you want an atoll. To, and then that's what they did in Vietnam. That to one hundred fives, they would swing around the stern and pump an atoll. Up, you know, up the butt, Bob, uh, to uh, to shoot down these one hundred fives. Well, come on, we have this highly maneuverable F fifteen. Uh, yeah, it's a huge platform, a huge platform. Uh, but th- these vloggers with their their sweep back, uh, wing sweep back mechanism, they were limited to going in a straight line. They were not going to turn behind anything. The, the turning radius was even worse than a 104. And we trained against 104s. The Germans had 104s. The De- I trained against Dan- Danish 104s. The Belgics had 104s. Uh, and so all you had to do was make hit the merge, make the first turn, and then it was like, oh, okay, um, I'll just taxi. Oh, I don't need afterburner after all. Just taxi up and, and taka, 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 taka. Okay, you're dead. Uh, because the turn rate is so so enormous, but the flogger's the same. So they really didn't have a, 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 a chance in a full-up air-to-air uh, environment. Uh they relied on what we call rope a dope tactics, where they would send out some some bait, sometimes a two ship, sometimes Singleton, uh, to 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 present a, a threat and then turn and hope that you followed that guy and weren't smart enough to say, well, if he turned away, well, maybe there's somebody else out here. Uh, but usually, you know, the wingman had a lock on the other guys. Anyway, uh, tactics could could uh, change, you know, turning the tables immediately. We also had, uh, as you well know, we had uh, floggers and fish bits uh, in the uh, the uh, uh, red flag airspace. Uh, that t- when we went to red flag, they showed up to play, and we got to train against. We each got a dedicated sortie flying against MiG twenty one or MiG twenty three, and I personally got a, a sortie against a MiG twenty three, uh, flown by a U.S. Navy fighter pilot. Uh, uh, his wing was. Uh, Fully smiling when that was he was a, a marine or a, an air force guy. Anyway, my point is that we breached with these guys. They they told us what we were going to see. Sure enough, that's exactly what we saw. We did side by side comparisons, flying comparisons, uh, both turning, acceleration, and pitch, uh, and everything. And and it just got to you, you got to see that oh, this thing is not that you you can't respect it. You have to respect it. But you don't have to be in fear of it. It's nothing to be afraid of. You get in there and you do your job using our tactics uh, uh, and, and heads, you know, play premiums up uh, ball game, and and you will you will dominate. And sure enough, that got proven in uh, in the Iraq War. Um, you know, Thirty six to zero kill ratio. That's that's about as good as you can get. Mm. I remember yeah, talking talking to you to you once about this scenario then with the sort of balloon going up and um you know the, the hordes coming out over the, through the the folder gap and you guys taking off out of Bitburg to do your 
thing. Um, and, and I said to you, what did you expect to happen? And you said to me, well, the first thing we thought was going to happen was the, I can't remember the designation, but the Coots, the, the, the NATO codename was Coots, were going to come along and they were yeah. going to do comms jamming. So so that would have been the first thing you would have had to have contended with. And, and anybody who has spent any time looking at the Eagle, uh, maybe not so much nowadays because of data link tactics. Um, right. Uh, but any da- prior to data link, um, comms is a big thing, you know, the discipline oh, of formation, discipline it, of how you how you handle radios. So how were you going to go up then against this well, threat that where you did have the technical overmatch, but now you were being denied comms and you couldn't necessarily know if you were in a full ship war, you know, I mean, how do you talk to the to, to number four if you're the flight leader in a four ship war, um, and you can, if you can't talk on the radio? Well, the um, that is a good question, it was, and it was one of our more daunting uh, challenges. Uh, as you know, we had half quick, which is a frequency jumping uh, uh, radio. Um, it wasn't the you know it wasn't the, the purest solution, uh, but it still, uh, it's still it still. Because it would jump to four different channels in one second. If if the bad guys were jamming one of those frequencies, you would get three quarters of a second worth of the word. If you if you're following, mm-hmm. then that'd be you know uh, with every transmission. So it, it may be break it. It may be breaking up. It may be uh, choppy. Um, but generally speaking, uh, and we practiced against uh, uh, Soviet jammers at red flag. Uh, they were out there. They, they were ground based. They were you know flying. In, in, I'll uh, uh, sixteen or whatever they were coots, but uh, that they were, uh, but there was comms jamming uh, that we would have to, you know, work our way through. Uh, the uh, uh, at the ranges of um, at the ranges of uh, employment for the F fifteen, because we were so far back in what we call our lane. Um, the um, the uh, uh, FRG of uh, West Germany uh, was was sectored into I think seven or eight lanes from north to south. Thirty second squadron up at Schusterberg had the northmost one. The Vilnarath FGR twos had the second one. Bitberg had the next three. Uh, the guys who would fly in, which I think was. Might have been Ed Lindner, or might have been Langley. Uh, they would have the the next two or three lanes you know, in Bavaria, so, and then and the, and the Bilderberg ones. Our three lanes looked right at the Fulda Gap, right at the bulge in uh, in Eastern Germany or the inner German border. Uh, the Coots, though, they were going to have to be behind to for their own survival. Build, they were going to have to be behind that, and uh, right unless you can direct the the jamming. Then, uh, and there's all sorts of, uh, of course, uh, scientific, you know, the, the laws of physics about the dissipation of uh, radio RF energy uh, as it goes out. So if it goes out on 360, then then it dissipates rather rapidly. If you can channel it, say a 30 degree column, uh, then you get 360 degrees worth of power. Uh, yeah, directed into that one area. So then the, the range of that jamming is long, mm. right? So maybe they can reach to the back end of the lane where we were. My, my point here is that on the early parts of an intercept, we were pretty well um, confident. We were, we were fairly confident that we would be able to communicate. But as we got closer to the merge, then it would become more and more of a problem. So, so in the early phase of the intercept where we're doing our targeting, you, know, you got four four F fifteens, uh, and the two flight leads. You know the formation leaders is directing you know, the uh, the the other f- the flight lead. Okay, you you take the guys to the south. I'll take the guys to the north. And then between you and your wingman, I got the leader. You got the trader. Those those were contracts. Uh, that was the squadron uh, standard. The uh, so so out of a four ship, the flight lead on the on the right would take that side of the enemy formation. The flight on the left would take the left, and so you really didn't have to say a lot. You just say standard, mm-hmm. sort standard, meaning I I got mine, you get yours, and then with your wingman, uh, 
sort standard. I got the leader, you got the trailer. Uh, now that that only that only that only that only take care of four targets. Yeah. <laughs> so so as you get to the merge in the second, you can blow all four of those up, and now you're in a, now you're trying to get out of there as fast, fast as possible uh, when the second wave is showing up. So that's where the comms really were worrisome. So I, w- I wouldn't say that, that we expected it to be a terrible problem early on in the engagement, but once it get, once the fight moved closer to the jammer, then of course it would. I think that's a that's a very interesting observation, isn't it? And maybe it, it can lead into a conversation around um, Amram. And again, you know, you, you you're, you're limited. Oh, that in was what, the other it, thing I, I should have mentioned. Yeah, ninety eighty was was slinging Amrams yeah. by the time I got to it, and that it, now that truly is a I wish you were dead muscle. Yeah. So, so, so tell us about that then. So, um, you know, again, you're not. Um, I'm not going to ask you for numbers and ranges or anything like that. But you know, I, we can see from my interviews with Desert Storm Mid Killers and from the, some of the tapes that have come out that they're shooting the AIM-7 at around about 13, 15, 16 miles, something like that, against yeah. a, a head-on target. Um, so for that period of time, you're in single target track. You've just said you're only going to take out four guys, and then you're, you're turning around and getting out of there. Um, what is the so, so as as a as as an eagle pilot who's going into an engagement and you're dominating, uh, how does how do you deal with the transition of I've just shot someone down a single target track and now I need to sanitize the airspace in front of me or I need to turn around and get out? Is there a sense of loss of control that happens at that point in an engagement? Um, what is it's the psychology? Loss of situation. Yeah, it's loss of loss of situational awareness. The more and more you focus on your one target the less and less you know about what's going on around that target or even around yourself. Uh, and that was one of the beauties of the, of the AMRAM, you know, the, the launch and leave or fire and forget uh, uh, system. Uh, so the, uh, so yeah, uh, let me, let, yeah, we, we had AMRAMs when I was at Schusterberg in the early nineties. And so that, that came out. Uh, and then of course at, uh, at Eglin at the end of the nights, uh, so, uh, so, so that was, uh, that was the biggest leap in, in lethality, uh, for the F-15. Um, the, uh, the one, once the, uh, the missile got to a certain point in its flight profile, uh, then, uh, because of the data leak and, and updating of the targets, uh, location to the missile, you could actually start looking for other targets, um. In, in a variety of ways, but uh, uh, so and because that missile, as soon as it would come off the airplane, would head for the ionosphere, uh, then it it flew in very thin air, and which enhanced its range. the The uh, AIM seven is like a small telephone pole, you know, a big clunky piece of metal uh, that, like I said, is ejected downward. Uh, and then it, then it started off like a like a freight train leaving the station, you know, not not a blazing acceleration, uh, but it would get moved. But but it was basically flying its own pursuit curve to the target, whereas the the Amram would would basically do a loft um, to get way out there. So so yeah, the I would say the normal engagement uh, ranges for an AIM seven were probably ten to twelve miles. Um, again, it. Uh, it uh, depends on the geometry a lot. If you're, if the, if the two, if you're the fire, if the two airplanes, the fire and the target are approaching each other, each at Mach one, then the missiles, the missiles only going to go a certain distance off your nose. So really, it's relying on the target to to meet it, hmm. to come to meet it, right? Uh, the AMRAM's not so much uh, because it's going much further, um, and it. And it knows um, where the where the target is located, uh, and it knows where to where to look to find it. <laughs> Again, it is, it, the, you know the most common uh, answer for a fighter pilot. You know what that is, right? It depends. It depends. Yeah, it depends. There's a lot of things. Yeah. So, so, so what a, what was the um, the story behind the Amram then? Because there was the A Mace. It was the A Mace Aval. Uh, that is the the evaluation that that delivered the AMRAM to the Air Force and the Navy wasn't it, or was that a uh, coincidence? I suppose that's true. We, we well look at it from 
looking at it from a historical point of view, the F, the F fifteen had a uh, uh, had the AM seven F, which was identical to the AM seven E on the F four, with the exception of Doppler. It could see looking down because of these shift in the Doppler frequency uh, of uh, a, an approaching target. So, whereas the F four it could not look down at all because the radar would become swamped with ground clutter. Uh, and a missile, it would go for the dirt, we would say. Uh, so my point is that the 87F was only a iter an iterative uh, improvement over the AM7E. Whereas the mic, that was much improved. It had uh, uh, abilities to distinguish between targets uh, and between... Uh, different targets is uh, Doppler uh, shifts. And then, it, uh, so it too was an iterative improvement. The Amram was a whole new animal, whole new uh, ball game. Uh, it, it required us to completely rethink our, our tactics so that we could, could launch and leave. Uh, and that way we would escape the increasing lethal range of, uh, of the Soviet uh, built airplanes, primarily the Fiker, the Fulcrum to a lesser, lesser extent. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, the the uh, Aimval Ace Dell. One the the thing that really came out of Aimval Ace Dell was the Aim Nine L Malima. Oh, okay, that's that was the immediate uh, uh, change in weaponry. But we needed we needed a a heat seeking vessel that we could shoot at the adversary in the front quarter and not have to go around to the stern and, uh, and pump it up his ass. Uh, so that, that's, that was the immediate one. The AMRAV is like the radar, uh, the, um, uh, the SAR, the semi-active radar, uh, equivalent of the heat seeking, the IR, uh, sidewinder. And so it took a lot. In fact, yeah, it took a long time, uh, to develop that capability uh, because of the sophistication, the nature of its sophistication. So, so tell us about situational awareness then and, um, you know, its importance. I mean, I, you know, well, my audience knows what SA is. We don't, you know, we don't have to go yeah. over the, the fundamentals. Right. But, I, but, it, but the importance in being able to build it and the importance of being able to keep it, how do you know when you've lost it? Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, the obvious answer about, uh, how do you know when you've lost it is when sh somebody shows up either in front of you or behind you that you weren't expecting <laughs> you're not supposed to be there. Uh, but that's, that's the, uh, dramatic end to the loss of situational awareness. I, I think, um, because of our ability as humans to to uh, re record at least impressions, if not images of spatial, spatially, okay, he's over here, that range, he's over here at this range. Uh, you're tied, you've got your radar tied to the to the closer threat. He he turns around and drags away. Your wingman says the other guy's coming in hot. So you, so you have you have less essay. Because you don't really have that guy either on your radar or or visual, but you have audio telling you about it. Uh, it's it obviously is uh, uh, is exacerbated when there's multiples out there. Um, the uh, adding uh, airplanes, number of airplanes to the arena, if you will, it's not a um, it's not a cumulative. Um, addition of airplanes as far as maintaining SA, it's exponential. It's not uh, uh, two times two. It's, uh, wow, that's not a good example, because but it, it does ex illustrate the extent of my math skills. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so, yeah, if you have uh, two airplanes uh, uh, and then, you know, uh, two more and two more, it, it goes up by multiples and not by just uh, yeah, adding those numbers in. So the more airplanes are out there, the less that's had. That is both good and bad. Uh, 
because once once the fight gets to be so large, and I would say somewhere upwards of four against four. So if we're talking uh, four versus eight or uh, six versus 12 or something like that, uh, when those fights occur, like a red fight, uh, and I've seen this in exercise after exercise, you get into a large fight, and and, and once the, the swirl starts, once the, the turning engagement starts, that is like a magnet. It attracts people because they're airplanes are planned for you know and they're you can see them now and, and visual is the overriding um, input to sa I know those airplanes are over there um, and so so everybody's going to start approaching that because they can see the targets uh, the the thing about sa is in a large fight nobody has any more sa than you do you may have less than anybody else. <laughs> but no one has any more than so 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 that's when you can actually be a lot more uh, uh, a lot more aggressive than 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 you shouldn't be timid. I guess is what I'm trying to say. You can be a lot more aggressive because nobody's got any more to say than you do, as long as you are shooting, turning, checking six, um, getting some space between you and the fireball, and then checking. Uh, Six again and pitching back. Uh, the Raiders and auto guns or some sort of super search or uh, auto acquisition mode. You get a snag uh, on a target. You start seeing airplanes and turning fights. You you, you don't have uh, uh, any more essays than anybody else, but you don't have any less either. You got you got more than anybody else. Well, you don't have more than you got just as much as anybody else. Um, so so the training typically the training would. Would teach us starting with two, two versus two, two v two, and then and then that graduated to four v four. The training teaches you what the what the, how your mental clock should be set. Now I'm trying to really answer your question. Um, so the so you get you get this sense of timing. Okay, about now I should be getting my sort. About now there should be missiles in the air. About now I should be you know cranking to one side or the other to to uh, stiff arm the. Uh, the uh, opponent. Uh, about now, my missile's timing out. About now, I don't have a clue anymore. <laughs> <laughs> because your essay constantly degrades as you focus on your particular part of the fight. Mm. So it's more of a timing thing. Uh, and, you know, you, you have this idea of your airplane going in a certain direction for a certain length of time, turning uh, away briefly, maybe coming back. Uh, but that's all disjointed, uh, is is my recollection. In that, uh, you never really the, the bad guys are never really where you think they're going to be when they actually show up, because we have this. It's like sitting in a car or sitting in this chair or your chair. You're you have no perception of motion, hmm. right? We don't. Have, we could we could be flying along in an airliner, doing <laughs> six hundred miles an hour. Uh, but there's no perception of motion. Uh, so, so the uh, for how long you're going on this vector versus this vector versus this, you know, coming back in, those are all distorted hmm. in terms of spatially tracking anything in your mind. But timing, on the other hand, as far as what you're seeing out front and having seen uh, so many engagements develop from the fights on call to to uh, box two kill the the um, the bandit in the left hand turns uh, uh, come out east you know, and then and then you start to rebuild your essay while the, the bad guys are behind you. A wax does that for you. Uh, your raw scope does that for you. You get some spatial relationships uh, off the raw scope. We got we got two on two at five o'clock and and one. Um, Further back at seven. Okay, I'm going to pitch back to the right to engage the two at five o'clock. They may have us locked up, but if I can get a quick snap lock and a missile in the air, then I can I can dodge whatever they're shooting. Hmm. Anyway, so so it's, it's a sense of timing more than a sense of uh, distance and direction. If that makes sense. Yeah, it it does. I mean, I think it, it ties in with another question I was going to ask you, and um, 
they're, they're allied, not, not necessarily, well, maybe they're related, you can tell me, but I, I've got, um, you know, some briefing guides that someone kindly gave me for, for the F-15 that, um, you know, talks about the tactical intercept, talks about BFM, talks about DACT, talks about all the different types of thing that can happen. And it's pages and pages of stuff. You know, yeah. what, what, what are you going to say on the radio? Who's doing what? When are they going to do it? And I wondered, you know, with the Eagle community being famous or maybe infamous for their very lengthy briefs and their even lengthier debriefs, and what you just said about building a sense through the, that building block approach of 2v2, 4v4, and so on, and, and just being in the air and doing it, I wondered how much that pre-planning also plays a part in it. Um, you know, to, to me, I look at those texts, and I think I wouldn't remember... A tenth of it, I wouldn't. You know, as soon as I got in the aeroplane, I'd dump it. It would all go. Um, so, so how much does the the preparation help? How much is that part of of being able to have SA and and how how do you get comfortable with all of that? Okay. Well, first of all, everything that we read and we brief uh, is is just to prepare you for to expect to see certain things airborne. Uh, and there is, you're right. There's a lot of, lot of, lot of ink on a lot of pages describing all that. Um, but it's what you experience airborne, uh, especially from the fights on call to the, to the knock it off, that you are learning repeatedly. Uh, uh, the, uh, and that's what I was trying to say about about the timing. Uh, as far as you get a sense, if, if you're starting an engagement at 40 miles and you're going to be shooting at 10 or 12, then you get a sense that that's going to take so long to, to get to that position, you know, the geometric, uh, ge- uh, geographically, if you will. Uh, so, so, so all of that briefing stuff, uh, some of it's teaching, you know, those briefing guides, some of them are instructor guides. Uh, some of it is just briefing, and then you, you uh, briefing the four ship. Then then uh, you split up, and then you do the two ship brief or the actual engagement as a two ship. Uh, so some of that uh, is uh, is is teaching, but but uh, the useful stuff is really telling yourself and your wingman what you can expect to experience, what you can what you'll see on your radar, what you'll see looking out front. What you'll see looking at six, what you'll hear, uh, uh, and and, and the uh, the different options that you have in different phases of the the fight, the uh, the debriefing uh, they can be excruciating. And and going back to your question about SA, my experience is when we're in a four ship debriefing, uh, everybody saw it differently, all four of us. Everywhere, and, and and what that tells you is that is that uh, the perceptions, the impressions, visually and 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 even timing wise, what's on the scope and uh, and what's on the raw scope, uh, those impressions are not uh, uh, accurate. Uh, they are to a degree, but that's why we have ACMI. That's why we have you know even more enhanced uh, uh, mission um, tracking. Uh, systems that that record uh you know back when i was at eklund we would have four television screens and video recorders uh video players set up and we would sync up from the fights on call we would sync up all four tapes and and some of the tapes would be looking at uh, the radar scopes uh some would be looking at uh, or some of the screens would be looking at the uh at the gun camera through the gun camera, camera through the gun camera, uh, so so that as you would be debriefing it, drawing the the, the lines, of, drawing the spaghetti on the on the the board, uh, there'll be guys who would swear they were in a left hand turning and right engagement, but all the airplanes that you're watching are turning right, you know, because it's just the depression. It must have been after he, you know, did some sort of ditch maneuver and came back uh, because he has this impression that he was turning left, but the whole fight is going to the right. Anyway, my point is that uh, 
is that that uh, uh, that's one of the problems with SA. It's just your perception. So you have to, when you realize that, oh, we're, I'm going the wrong way, meaning I'm thinking that I'm going the wrong way. Then now, if, now your your gyros are tumbling, and you have no way of correcting it except for looking around and recaging them and, and getting your mind to start over. It, it's a it's a uh, very deliberate and uh, almost exhausted mental uh, exercise and experience as far as re- you know, recognizing. Okay, this is not what I expected to see, so my essay is wrong. I've got to read reload uh, the essay uh, properly respect to reflect reality is, is there a uh, a call that you have to make if you lose this i mean you've got you know two's blind if you lose sight of the flight lead um is there an equivalent if you if it's all gone to shit and you just don't know what's going on and you know because presumably yeah. at some point you become more of a liability than you know oh yeah you- yeah and and the only solution is to leave the fight yeah uh Leaves bugging out west, tumbleweed. Tumbleweed is the radio call. Oh, tumbleweed. Okay. Yeah, because tumbleweeds, you know, they just blow with the wind. They're they're not thinking animals at all. They're not even a thinking plant. They're a dead plant. It's just rolling around, subject to the wind. So so when you re- realize you've lost SA to the point where you're a detriment, oh, and, and and you're just fighting for your own survival. The only thing that you have going for you is that you're still alive. And so you need to get away from everybody else as quickly as possible. Hmm. Now, this go this goes out east tumbleweed. You, you, you get your speed up, you get down low, you hunker down real low in the cockpit, <laughs> <laughs> where your chin is almost on the on the trim button. So maybe he won't see me. <laughs> and then and then you know as your heart slows down. Okay, well, let me let me look. Let me look. well, no, nobody back there. Uh, nobody back there. Little rollover, you know, belly check. Okay, now I know that there's nobody around me. Okay, now you know a, a, a ninety good hard turn to ninety degrees because that for sure will. Uh, as soon as you make a, a hard turn, if there's anybody chasing you, then they're going to have to pull lead, mm. right? That means they're going to show you their belly. So out there, there's this little bitty speck. And it, it was a needle point because he was nose on before. Now it's a little speck because he's showing you belly. Yeah. He's got bigger plantle. Aha. That's one of those guys. Okay. Obviously, it's not your wingman because <laughs> he wouldn't be pulling lead. He would be trying to get uh, back to you. So so then okay, I'm going to put that guy on the nose, see what he does. And and he'll have to get out of plane. You know, it, it just develops from there. But my my point is that that you got to you got to try to build back SA uh, in building block because it's not all going to come back at once. When when, you, when your SA is shrunk down to where you're hunkered down in the cockpit running for your life, then you can't you you don't get a massive dose of SA. Well, uh, AWACs can help. You know, they they can tell you disco. The fight is at, at six o'clock. At uh, six miles, eight miles, twelve miles, because <laughs> you keep running away. <laughs> uh, so, so you can get us saved back. Uh, and of course, daddling these days is is just awesome. It alleviates a lot of what we're talking about. Did you ever fly with J Tits? Did J Tits come to no, you? Or no, ever did. Okay. okay. So, so, t- so tell I did, me. I did see a, I did see a cute T shirt one time though that said. Show me your J-Tits. <laughs> That's all I know about J-Tits. Was it your T-shirt? No, no. I saw that at the I saw that at the club at Nellis one time. That's awesome. T- tell me about your personal journey through this. Then you you so you've you've gone you've you obviously had your trials and tribulations at the academy. You've come through, done well in pilot training. You've got to flight commander in the first year at uh, Bitburg. Um, are you struggling with anything? Has uh, you know is, what, what has challenged you in, in the Eagle? I mean, as as a pilot, as a fighter pilot, where have you had periods of self doubt, or um, uh, where where have you thought, uh, you know, I'm I'm not as good as I thought I was? Well, as a, as I got older, um, I'm, 
I slowly began to have the feeling that I wasn't as good as I uh, as I used to be. Like when I got to Schusterberg, um, but like that, uh, like that uh, country western song is. I may not be as good as I used to be, but I'm as good once as I ever was. <laughs> <laughs> So I just had to, I just had to husband my good days and, and make them pay off. But, uh, but yeah, uh, and of course, as as you get older uh, and go up the the career ladder, uh, I was never a, um, I was never a brown noser, or you know, never had a political uh, aspirations, if you will. Uh, I personally believe from my training at the Air Force Academy that if I do my job and if I do it the best I can, then I'll get promoted on time. So, and, and that's the, that was my guiding philosophy for, you know, uh, doing my job, doing my duty. Um, and, uh, because I had some talent and skills, uh, that worked. Hmm. That worked. That's promoting on time. I was never anybody's, uh, golden boy. Uh, when I went to Schusterberg, we only had three lieutenant colonels. So it was a one squadron fighter group. Uh, uh, one of the one of the lieutenant colonels uh, was uh, chief of uh, operations for the group. One was the squadron commander. The third one was the chief of safety. So uh, so I arrived and and I was on the squadron commander's list because I I'd gone to um, our, uh, Armed Forces Staff College, uh, and let me say too that that, that uh, my guiding principles uh, was uh, was that if I do my job, as I said, if I do my job and do it well, if I devote myself to to studying and, and learning what I need to know to to do well, then I'll get promoted on top. Because I owed that thing I wanted to add is I owed that to my family. I didn't want to be so much of a fighter pilot. And not do things like get my master's degree, go to uh, their command and staff uh, college, and forsake the professional development that the Air Force expected of of its leaders, uh, because that would cost me a promotion in, in my family desert for all the time that, that they spent without me. You know, I, I went to home and TDYs and, and long hours. Then certainly uh, not getting promoted. Uh, would have would have definitely been a a, a, a bad thing, a down a downside. So I uh, I worked hard on uh, getting my master's degree and getting my um, my uh, professional military education, uh, just to be sure that I made those promotions on time, and I did. Uh, so I wound up at Schusterberg uh, as as just. Uh, but Joe, Joe was say, uh, uh, everyday average kind of a guy. I can't remember the exact words in that song, but uh, <clears throat> and so I, I knew that I wasn't going you know, to. I was on the squadron commander's list because anyone uh, uh, that you know had gone to school and had their masters and and uh, had solid uh, performance reports. Um, and mine were mine were solid. They weren't exceptional, but they were solid. You're going to be on the Spartan Command list. You've shown them leadership potential. I was, I was flight commander at uh, at Bidberg. I was a flight commander at um, Holloman after that. Uh, so you know, I I led uh, led uh, Air Force officers uh, in the in those squadrons. So uh, I demonstrated that um, to where I was on the Spartan Commanders list, but the squadron. Uh, had the commander and the operations officer was a major, even though it was a lieutenant colonel position, uh, it was a major. Uh, and uh, after being there for about a year, uh, his promotion board came out and he was just strictly a fighter. He didn't care about anything else. He didn't care about partying on Friday and the weekends, but he didn't care about maintenance. He didn't care about, uh, about the, the administrative parts of the base or the, or the people that worked in those offices, he looked down on them because he was a pilot, so he was arrogant and superior. 
and um, as, and sure enough, he did not get promoted. And so now, uh, and the uh, group commander, he called me into his office and said that, that uh, on Monday, I want you to report for duty at the, at the fire squadron. Uh, and pay attention because in four months you're going to be the Spartan commander because you got the passed over major, the job at Ramstein, and and he got the Spartan commander uh, uh, set off a year early to Air War College. Wow. So I, I really benefited in terms of timing from one guy's poor performance in terms of how he approached uh the profession of being a fighter pilot. Uh, and the other one, you know, there's a dear friend of mine, uh, Fred Bell, Taco Bell. Uh, he, he got, um, uh, promoted early, if you will, to go to uh, war college because of a, uh, a clash of personalities with the group commander and the group commander, uh, just couldn't take it anymore. And, and had Fred had Taco, uh, moved on to bigger and better things. And so suddenly, you know, before I knew it, I was a sworn commander. Um, and, that's, it, and that was fine. It worked out great. But I'll have to say that even though I flew quite a bit as a chief of safety, and I was a flight lead, I was a Porsche flight lead, I'd been an F-15 instructor at Bitburg. I'd been an instructor at Holloman. Uh, but by now, uh, because of my advancing age, uh, I think I was passing 40, uh, my... Uh, my my uh, G tolerance wasn't what it used to be before all those beers, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and other things. Um, I was still, I think, as mentally as uh, as sharp, but but uh, I probably wasn't as quite as quick, and maybe not quite as aggressive as I used to be. Uh, but anyway, uh, so. Uh, so that's to answer your question about, you know, was there ever any loss of confidence? I wouldn't say a loss of confidence. It was more of a, an awareness that I wasn't as good as I used to be. Uh, and then, uh, of course, once I made full colonel and at Eglin, I didn't fly nearly as much as I should have, or I wish I had, or as much as I did as a squadron commander. And so then my, my tactical skills, uh, you know, atrophied, uh, quite a bit where I, I really in all honesty um i really was just a, a training aid if you will mm -hmm. in that uh, i would be, i would always be leading the red air uh the adversary part of the the, the sorties to fall out of equity i mean i wasn't going to go to war why waste time on me uh you know when we deployed to the sandbox two times out of two years uh i was never going uh, because I was going to stay home in my the store. Not that that uh, lessened my motivation for staying sharp, but there was just so much to running the running the wing and running the base that that I just I, I could not participate as, at the same level I had as a squadron commander. And as a squadron commander, I couldn't participate uh, for my own proficiency as much as I had in my two previous fighter assignments. And, and that's just the nature of the of the the environment. Uh, the professional uh, path, if you will. Hmm. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I always yeah. got that impression from you that you had not, um, you know, you had been successful in your own right, but you hadn't sort of sold your soul in order to make it happen. And that because uh, oh, I, no. I remember no. you saying that you were told you had to pick. Oh, maybe Annie told me, but um, you, you had to you had to play golf in order to, to progress in the air force. And did you have one golf yeah. lesson and then never go back? It, yeah. Well, no, I, I, I took golf. Uh, Golf was a mandatory sport to take at the Air Force Academy. And and here I was, a boy from Arkansas in Texas. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can play golf, right? So, uh, so I, you know, I passed the, the course. I did not play golf again until I was a lieutenant colonel. And, uh, and I took uh, golf uh, at, uh, at War College as one of the uh, physical education uh, courses because... The Air Force expects colonels and generals to play golf. So that, because a lot of business gets conducted on the golf course and a lot of business gets conducted with congressmen um, and other you know, civilian officials. Uh, 
So you had to be able to be um, respectable, not good, brilliant, uh, but respectable. You, you you couldn't be the worst guy in the in the you know the force in the force ship. Uh, so uh, I probably told you the story, uh, but uh, but uh, playing golf at the at Air War College, um, I had a really bad slice or or uh, whatever that other one is, you know, going to one side or the other. Uh, and so uh, so the uh, the guys that were playing with said, Doug, you need to take some extra instructions, some EI, and you go back to the pro and, and have him give you some pointers and straighten out your, your drive. Uh, I mean, it had gotten so bad that my my slice was so so bad to to the right that I would wind up hitting the ball about 30, I mean, 30 degrees to the left so they would come in with a land on the green to the <laughs> and, and and the guys I was playing with said, you know, that that's just not that's just not the way to play golf, Doug. You need to take some extra rest. So so I go to the I go to the pro and uh and I get warned up and then he comes out you know, puts down this little lawn chair sits down and uh watches me do a few and he goes, Doug, I think I know what your problem is. You need to stick your ass out more. And I thought to myself, I'm sorry. If this game requires me to stick my ass out more, it's not the game for me. <laughs> so, so I muddled through you know, two years as the vice commander. Uh, I've been playing golf with generals and, and, the, uh, and the wing commander. Wing commander, he was, he was, he was a politician. Uh, very politically minded officer um, who eventually made it to, to two stars. So, you know, you can't knock it if that's your goal. Um, but uh, so I was respectful, respectable enough to where, okay, they didn't laugh me off the course much, many times. Um, and then, and then, you know, when, you, when you're the vice wing commander and you're going away, you know, you're, you're, you're assignments over and they're preparing the going away party. And and every subordinate unit to the to the group to the wing in this case, is is preparing going away presents for you, you know, and so I was down visiting one of the maintenance shops, the fab shop, fabrication shop, and they're the ones that would make uh, out of just a, a block of aluminum or titanium, they would make a a a component for the airplane if there was something that was bent or broken in one of the airplanes airplanes, and so they um. They said, "Well, sir, what, what would you like for a going away present? Typically, we we make a a putter, a golf putter, out of a, a blivet, a block of uh, of aluminum, uh, and it's in the shape of half of an FAT, where you now the chopped off half is the surface that you hit the ball with. And, and they showed me one. They said, just like this, but we'll make yours since you're right-handed. We'll make yours right-handed because." We gave, we we made this one for your predecessor, the the priest, the uh, vice wing commander ahead of you. We made it for him, and uh, we thought he was left-handed, but he wasn't. So then we had to make another one right-handed. So we have this one to show you. And I said, "Oh, this is perfect. This is perfect. You don't have to make me a thing. Just give me this one, because I'm never gonna play golf again." <laughs> so save yourself the effort. Don't do anything special for me. You know, I, I'll show you all, all the proper appreciation for you haven't made this thing for me. But don't do it. Don't do a thing. Just give me this thing. Did, did you keep it? And it's in my closet. Is it? It's in my closet somewhere. So you did keep it. So if, so if, so if you ever want a left-handed F-15 putter, let me know and I'll give it to you. <laughs> all right. We are we're up against time, at least for me. It's, uh, it's getting late in the evening here. But um, so much more to cover. So... If anybody's read the Eagle Engaged book, and um, it's the big hardback of 15 book, um, you'll notice in there that Disco actually wrote a couple of narratives about flying against different aircraft types. How do you fly against the F-16? How do you fly against the F-14? And so on and so forth. And I would really, Disco, if you'll come back, if you'd, be, if you'd agree to come back and do a part two. <clears throat> well, you've sure. got to because you need to do a plug for your Battle of Britain book. Uh, and we run out of time. Yeah. You can't do it now. So, but but if you'd agree to come back and do a part two, it would be great to hear about that. And also, you know, we I would be interested in in learning from you. 
you know, how you fly the airplane. What, is, what does it feel like? How does it talk to you? Um, you know, how do you how do you know when you're flying it optimally? What are the cues? What are the indications right. to you? Um, right. So, so, and of course, there's there's a bunch of sort of cultural stuff for us to talk about too. Um, there are a number of anecdotes you told me on, over the years that I would really love it if you would repeat. You know, things involving hotels and medevac and um, re- relocating parked cars and things like that. So, um, if you if you would agree to come back uh, for everybody listening at home, that's what would be in store for you. If, yeah, you, you know, I'm more than willing to uh, to uh, tell these stories again and again and again. So, yeah. So, I appreciate your being interested in asking. Thanks, Disco. Okay. Well, on that note, then I will say thank you very much for these last two hours. It's been it's been lovely talking to you and actually getting you on tape. Um, normally, I'm I'm privileged to have these conversations with you, and I'm usually the sole uh, sort of uh, recipient of 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 these these wonderful bits of information and and uh, anecdotes anecdotes and and insights. So, so thank you for sharing it with the audience too. You're welcome. I, I do have to add it that uh, if, I hope that I haven't offended anyone with some of my language, some of my fighter pilot vernacular, as I call it. But if I have, too bad.